The ICO phenomenon is a real phenomenon. So happy to be alive and no government is ever going to take it down, period. It's like the Wild West right now, really. I think we've raised $2.3 billion this year and I think we'll probably close north of $3 billion this year which is insane. But the truth is, I think in 2018, like Brock Pierce says, I think we'll probably do $10 billion next year. There's been a lot of people waiting on the sidelines, sort of looking at the technology, wanting to make sure that it wasn't a fad and it was something that actually had longevity to it. And I think that we've proved that. And so a lot of institutional money and a lot of people are really looking to, to get funds into the cryptocurrency space. And the ICOs are the most predominant vehicle for bringing that capital into the area. So the initial coin offering are, are amazing. It's very hard for good companies with good technology to get funded. So that's the beauty of the ICO. I think now we will go to ICOs there for real company scale-ups that have revenue, that have a going concern, and that can use ICO as a true instrument. You know, we need the regulators to come in, you know, we need legislation to come in, and that's all going to happen. We, get, we will have people that get hurt, and this, uh, we have people that think we have a very big balloon being pumped up. That's all true, probably. And what we see today with ICOs is essentially a better solution for venture funding than the existing one. Not only it's better, it's actually not a fair competition. It's like trying to compare printing press to the internet. You cannot compare between the two. One is so much more technologically advanced than the other. So what we're seeing today is that the large majority of entrepreneurs and investors are discovering that there is a technological solution just like journalists were discovering the internet back in the day. And I believe that more and more venture funding activity will move toward ICOs and we're going to see a lot of bumps, a lot of creativity, a lot of volatility, but definitely this is where the, go, the world is going and I personally believe that where it should go. About a month ago, we put together the, the Blockchain Investor Consortium, and one article in Cointelegraph produced 100 crypto hedge funds between three and $50 million in, in digital assets in each one of them. And when we did a dinner together with all of us, we realized we're sitting on $2 billion of digital assets. And everybody wants to get a piece of this, but everybody's trying to skip the due diligence checklist. By the end of this year, it will be a $4 billion in crypto asset investments, which is phenomenal. Our fund did 61% ROI in the first quarter because, yeah, the market went up and it was with us, but also because we have very sophisticated people. and We've developed and invested in amazing uh, algorithm and, and trading tools to allow up to 85% accuracy on forecasting a specific trade. Well, there's a lot of enemies of ICOs, and they're enemies for good reasons. It's because ICOs are extremely dangerous. Imagine you're a mom pop you hear about this opportunity to be the next Bitcoin, which has made your, your long removed nephew a millionaire. And so you go in on that. That project proceeds to go bust because most projects will go bust and you lose all your money. Who's responsible? In the current climate, nobody. That's not acceptable. We have regulation on this stuff for a reason. And the enemies of ICOs are the people who are generally looking out for the public good, not bankers trying to crush any potential new innovation. The main advice is to understand that doing an ICO is, is very close to doing an IPO. I'm not talking about the legal side because that you know, could be controversial here and, and there are, of course, rules to follow. I'm talking more in terms of communication, the way you communicate to the market, the fact that you get a lot of questions. Also, the other advice is be well surrounded, of course. Focus on the team, people are helping you. Don't er underestimate the, the help that you know, a good team and good advisors can, can bring. But it's, it's very exciting and, of course, don't get only focused on token price, amounts you need to raise. You know, these are the usual criteria, but I think there is a overall quality of the project that needs to be maintained and uh, not, not necessarily rush it. I guess the first advice I give on an ICO project is make sure that your token is something that the world actually needs. Ethereum, over time, uh, which we were lucky enough to work with in the early days, uh, has evolved to something that is needed by a lot of folks for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's created a really great infrastructure for smart contracts that's continuing to evolve and has then evolved its own ecosystem with asset creation layers uh, which has allowed other people to create their own entities and it's taken on a life of itself. So think five years out. What is your token going to be doing in five years? Can you envision its growth into something that 
half the world needs. Be very careful with promoting a token, especially look very carefully at the rules in the US. Why the US? Because it is basically the only jurisdiction which carries out extraterritorial enforcement. So outside of the territory of the US will come and enforce their laws. No other country really does this. And so therefore it's important that you look at the US. Even if you are not selling your token in the US, you should bear in mind the rules in the US. And it is unfortunately the case that most tokens that are not functioning are probably securities and therefore you should probably try and organize your token as a security token or as close to being a security token if you, as possible. So the ICO, the diligence checklist that we put together was really meant for uh, all the great projects out there to understand that there's a lot of things they need to prepare. Okay, they need to prepare a white paper, which they know. They need to prepare a pitch deck. They need to go around the world and speak at conferences. But that's not enough. They really have to produce a lot of documents when it comes to legal and about the team and real biographies and, and many, many documents that investors like to see in any traditional financing. And ICOs now have become the coolest, hippest thing. But it's really a financial instrument that really needs to be further uh, tuned and, and the more people that think that it's just easy money and I have my business and I can't get more venture capital money or private equity money, oh, let me just decentralize, put the word decentralize in front of it and blockchain at the end of it, it doesn't work. So they can't fool us anymore. So we've invested $3.5 million from our fund in 15 different ICOs uh, after looking at probably 400 ICOs, okay? That's a lot of work. Uh, we spend five to 50 hours on each ICO to do proper due diligence. Why? Because after 15 ICOs, we go back and we look at some of them, we say, ah, we should have done more due diligence because there was much more there that we should have looked at. When I advise ICOs, I usually focus on what are the differences in this solution compared to uh, more traditional solutions. Is that you don't really have to create a for-profit company. In fact, the most successful ICO in e history, Ethereum, did not create a for-profit company. What they create is an online economy which is defined by its own currency. And that is the economy where the ICOs are happening. So this is really important thing to understand that we could not create online economies before. It's only now that people can actually issue secure digital currency that anyone can work with. Only now that you can create an economy which the economy itself is non-profit, but creating the economy can be a for-profit venture because as you know, people that were involved in creating Ethereum and participated in the ICO has made a fortune from their investment, even though the economy itself is non-profit. The interesting thing about bubbles is that you never know they're a bubble until they pop. So we do know that we're in a boom. There's unquestionably a boom going on when you go from 10 billion to 150 billion in a year. So. If all of a sudden it drops back down to 20 billion, we know it was a bubble. I personally think that it's going to get much bigger before there's a substantial pullback. And it also depends, what is the reason for the pullback? Uh, is the reason something artificial, like Jamie Dimon says Bitcoin's dead, and people get panicked over that, even though he went out and bought Bitcoin afterwards, or at least a, a tracking stock? Um, or is it something uh, that is more serious, like, you know, ICOs being made illegal in China, which was kind of expected because Facebook's illegal there and it hasn't stopped Facebook from being one of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, Korea was a little bit of a surprise. So if all of a sudden you saw India and Canada and Italy and the EU say no more ICOs, first of all, I think that they would have to justify that um, and say what law is actually being broken. Um, I think what probably is going to happen in the next year if the boom keeps happening and say this time next year we're sitting at $500 million of, uh, of assets would be that maybe there's uh, a pause where they say, okay, we don't want to have, we want to have a moratorium on all US-based or Canada-based ICOs. But that means that the really good projects will just move their feet. And if Mauritius lets people uh, go and set up, people are going to go to Mauritius. I really don't think, I think Pandora's box has been opened. And I think that um, some great companies and foundations have been created. 
And so I really don't think it's realistic that every country in the world is going to simultaneously say, we have to get rid of crypto. I think the main role is very similar to the role we always had with, um, with startups. It's mainly connecting and trying to avoid issues that we know, hurdles that we know. So go directly maybe to the right lawyer, hopefully that will help them, or avoid uh, service providers that may not be useful for certain projects. Um, and then of course the connection to the uh, networks, a network of people that could buy tokens or could advise them, you know, it's, so that's mainly the role really. Uh, the other role is everything around token economics. So an ICO can be successful because you have a good project and a good team and sometimes a good product that's already there. But if the token economics are not good, then it won't work. So, you know, people have to feel that when they buy the token, uh, the secondary market can be maintained, uh, you're going to be on some exchanges. You don't, need, of course, you cannot guarantee it. But if you have a good grasp of what you need to be on the exchange, what is a strategy post ICO? You know, ICO in many ways is like any funding. It's a, a beginning of a of a company, an adventure, of a development, right? So in that sense, the post ICO work is quite important as well. So all the PR hype out there was really created by Cointelegraph. It's really your fault. You allowed some certain articles to appear by really well-educated people with really good projects. So the more people that read about you, the more people wanted to invest in them. So the hype is, there's two kinds of hype. There's real hype, and there's the mainstream media, and then the, the mainstream crypto media, which includes Cointelegraph. And that's the credibility that you bring to the world, which is great. And then there's the BS hype, which is really created by fake news on less known blogs and investors will eventually learn what is real and what is not. No government needs to interfere to tell us what is real and what's not because people will learn through their own experiences and if they're stupid enough to invest in certain deals where they read inaccurate information, then they will learn because they lost their money and there's nothing wrong with that. There's no learning without pain and therefore people sometimes have to lose 10, 20, 100 dollars, 10,000 dollars and then they will learn much faster than if any government tried to regulate it and educate us what to do and what not to do because it's a very old saying that libertarians believe in which is government has no place in my wallet to tell me what to do with my time and my money and has no place in my bedroom to tell me what to do and what positions I should be allowed to sit on my bed. Yes?